This is a pre-recorded presentation, so the presenter will not be taking any questions. However, all questions asked during the live presentation, along with answers, are included at the end of this presentation. To learn more about our upcoming patient and family conferences in your area, please visit aamds.org slash conferences. To view other recorded presentations or to register for other live online learning events, please visit aamds.org slash learn. Welcome to our live webinar titled, What are MPNs? Everything you need to know. Thank you for joining us. My name is Angie Onifred, Director of Patient Education at AMDSIS, and I'll be moderating the presentation today. As we get started, I would like to acknowledge the generous support of our patients, families, and caregivers for providing support for this webinar program, and also to the MPN Advocacy Education International Foundation for their promotional support of this webinar. Today's presenter is Dr. Stephen O. Dr. O is the Assistant Professor in the Division of Hematology at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri. Dr. O heads a translational research group focused on the pathogenesis of myeloproliferative neoplasms, also known as MPNs, with the goal of translating the work into improved therapies for MPN patients. He completed his MD and PhD at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago, Illinois. Dr. O went on to complete a residency, fellowship, and postdoctoral fellowship at Stanford University School of Medicine in Stanford, California. With that said, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. O. Thank you, Angie, for the introduction, and welcome to everyone who is participating in the webinar today. I'd also like to thank the AAMDS Foundation for the opportunity to speak today. Um, as many of you probably know, today is MPN Awareness Day, so uh, this webinar is in recognition of that. Um, and uh, also, uh, thanks to all the patients and caregivers and patient advocates out there who um, all of us together are working towards a, uh, a cure for MPNs. So with that uh, said, let's go ahead and get started. Um, the title of my presentation is, What are MPNs? Everything you need to know. Uh, I, I welcome questions from the audience. Uh, this, this slide, the slide deck here is um, relatively, uh, a relatively broad overview, so please um, go ahead and put in any questions you might have. All right, so um, let's start with just some very, very basic information. So what is blood? So, uh, you know, as many of you know, there are different types of blood cells, and, and essentially there are three main groups of blood cells. You have your white blood cells, which uh, play an important role in fighting infection, red blood cells, which carry oxygen, and when we talk about laboratory testing, we measure red blood cells uh, for the most part by looking at hemoglobin or hematocrit. And then you have platelets, and, and platelets are really important in helping the blood to clot. So there's a problem with the platelets, this can lead to bleeding. For instance, if the platelet count is low, if the platelet count is high, it can uh, contribute to excessive blood clotting, and we'll get into that in more detail. The liquid part of the blood is the plasma. That's mostly water, but it contains a number of, of vitamins and, and proteins, and, and, um, and uh, in particular, uh, cytokines, which are thought to play a role in the inflammatory uh, uh, picture that is part of these diseases. Okay, so what are myeloproliferative neoplasms or MPNs? So this is a, a group of blood cancers, so there's, there are a number of different types of MPNs, and we'll go into detail about that, but these are a group of diseases that are blood cancers, uh, and I'll come back to that point in a second, and essentially in, in these diseases, in the bone marrow, Something has changed so that uh, the bone marrow starts to produce too many of one of these particular um, uh, blood cells. So, for instance, red blood cells, platelets, uh, certain types of white blood cells, um, and this is seen clinically, for instance, with an elevated hemoglobin or hematocrit, an elevated platelet count. Um, it can be seen with an elevated white blood cell count, uh, but essentially there's too many cells being made. Um, and I'll draw the distinction here between MPNs and myelodysplastic syndrome, or MDS, where, uh, you know, from the, mo from the most part, you have the opposite situation. In MDS, typically, you have low blood counts. 
Um, now, it gets a little complicated because, in, in particular, with 1-MPN myelofibrosis, that can be an issue, too. And patients commonly have anemia, but it, well, we know, we'll get into more detail about that uh, in a few slides. But on the most basic level, the, um, the distinction between MPNs is high blood counts, MDS typically low blood counts. And coming back to the term blood cancer, so one of the, one of the questions that patients often ask uh, uh, when they see me and are first diagnosed with an MPN is, do I have cancer? And my answer to that question is, Yes, MPNs are a form of blood cancer, but I try to make a distinction between MPNs and, and other types of cancers. There's many, many different types of cancer. So um, by, I, 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 I think that MPNs are cancer in the sense that, again, as the slide indicates, you have a situation where blood cells are, too many blood cells are being produced. There's something going gone wrong, and cells are essentially proliferating out of control. So that at its root is really the definition of cancer. But again, there are many different types of cancer. Some cancers have a very dire prognosis. Um, others have a relatively favorable prognosis. So the term cancer you know, can mean many, many different things. But strictly speaking, MPNs are blood cancers. All right, so um, more about MPNs. So what exactly are these diseases? I, we talked about that. Uh, you have a situation where there are too many blood cells being produced, and how does this happen, or why does this happen? Well, these are, first of all, what we call clonal diseases, meaning that they start from one individual cell, and that clone or cell grows into many, many cells, and that is what propagates the disease. And this is thought to be largely driven by mutations, changes in the DNA. And when that happens, uh, typically, or what's thought to happen is that these mutations occur in a stem cell. So, um, pointing here at, at the top of this, this diagram at a stem cell, a, a hematopoietic stem cell, which is a type of primitive cell that is able to give rise to all of the different blood cells in your body. So, in this diagram, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, sort of complicated terms here, but the point is that these stem cells um, can produce um, all kinds of blood cells, lymphocytes, uh, neutrophils, red blood cells, platelets, etc. And so these diseases, the MPNs, are thought to start at the stem cell level. And when these mutations are acquired, they, it drives the proliferation of all the cells downstream, uh, all these myeloid cells. So again, red blood cells, uh, platelets, monocytes, other types of white blood cells. It doesn't really involve the lymphocytes. Um, and, and it's not completely understood exactly why that's the case, but it really, as the name says, myeloproliferative involves the myeloid cells, meaning all the cells shown here can be overproduced. Um, over time, uh, it can start with one mutation, additional mutations can be acquired, and these can contribute to the clinical features um, that um, are present in any patient with an MPN. The point on the bottom here is really important which is that these mutations that happen, they are acquired, they are not inherited. So, when, again, one of the basic questions that I'll, I'll often get is, you know, do I need to worry about my children? Um, are they going to get this too? And the short answer is no, because the mutations that uh, really drive these diseases are not something that you're born with, they're not something that are passed down to your children. Um, there is a very slight caveat in that we, it is well known that Family members of patients with MPNs are at a slightly increased risk of eventually being diagnosed with an MPN, so it's not unheard of to have a patient where they might have a sibling or a parent or, or, or whatnot who also had an MPN. Um, we know that that occurs. However, that risk is relatively low, and combined with the fact that MPNs are relatively uncommon, the overall risk of any family member of developing an MPN is still quite low. So we don't really recommend any specific or special screening for family members of patients with MPNs because, again, while there might be a slightly increased risk, it is still overall a very low risk of, in any given person of developing an MPN. Okay, so types of MPNs. So there are, are there are a number of different types, as you can see on this slide. Um, today's talk is going to focus on the three so-called classic MPNs, polycythemia vera or PV, 
central thrombocythemia or, e, or ET, and primary myelofibrosis or PMS. Um, and the, these are grouped together in part because they, and, and each of these diseases, uh, a, it's very common to have a mutation in, for instance, the JAK2 gene, which we'll talk about in, in more detail in a second. Um, so these are, these are kind of linked together in that way, and they also share a number of clinical features. They are distinct diseases, as we'll talk about, um, but they um, also have a, a number of shared characteristics. If anyone has questions about the other MPNs, I'm glad to address those at the end of the talk. Okay, so what is polycythemia vera, or PV? So this essentially is a disease in which too many red blood cells are produced. And uh, you can see from the picture here, you've got on the left a patient with polycythemia vera. These are the red blood cells, way more red blood cells than, uh, for instance, than a normal patient or a normal person, and that essentially is what constitutes PV. Now, while an elevated hemoglobin and hematocrit, too many red blood cells is the defining feature of PV, it is also quite common to have elevations in the other counts, so white blood cell count, platelets, these are also often increase. So really, although, again, overproduction of red blood cells is the defining feature, um, this really is a situation where many different types of blood cells can be overproduced. Okay. Now, what, what, what causes PV? Um, so I mentioned uh, this JAK2 mutation. So this um, gene, JAK2, is mutated in virtually every patient with polycythemia vera. So greater than 95%, and that's shown in this pie chart here. The blue is patients with this JAK2 V617F mutation. Even in the small sliver of patients who lack the JAK2 mutation, there is an alternate JAK2 mutation, this X112 mutation, in a small number of patients, and it really leaves only a very, very small percentage, maybe around 2% or less, who really truly have polycythemia vera but lack a mutation in JAK2. So clearly, whether it's through a JAK2 mutation or some other mechanism, that, that is the defining feature um, at the genetic level, that something is driving activation of this JAK2 gene. And um, what JAK2 does is it signals downstream of there to uh, essentially increase cell proliferation and avoid cell death. So that, again, this, this makes sense when you see these elevated blood counts. Well, you've got this JAK2 mutation that's leading to uncontrolled cell proliferation. Um, as far as the instance, uh, PV and the other MPNs are relatively uncommon, as I, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so we're talking less than five out of 100,000 people. Um, the prevalence is a, little, is a little higher. In the case of PV, about 22 out of 100,000, um, which is related to the fact that generally people with PV tend to live for many years with the disease. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Um, this disease is typically diagnosed in older individuals, so older than 60 years old, um, as is the case for all the MPNs. But we do see uh, the disease um, in patients of all ages, even uh, very rarely down to children. Um, and there's a, a specific subgroup of patients that are somewhat unique who tend to be younger, younger women, uh, almost always women, younger, and um, often present with a specific type of blood clot affecting the abdominal veins. So we don't fully understand why that's the case, that there is a that unique group of patients, but it's, it's well established that it exists. So um, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but most MPN patients do not have a family history. Uh, again, I, there are, um, there is not uncommon to have, uh, or unheard of to have uh, patients with multiple family members affected, but for the most part, um, there, there's not a strong familial clustering. Okay, so what are the symptoms and complications that can occur with PV? Um, I should, you know, make make sure to, to say that some patients with PV have minimal or no symptoms. So I, we commonly see patients who may have been uh, initially brought to attention because they had a routine physical, they had a blood count checked, and lo and behold, their hemoglobin was 18 or 20, and that prompted evaluation for that, and they feel fine. So that that occurs. Um, we also have uh, sort of the opposite on the spectrum. We have patients who are quite symptomatic. They can have multiple of the things listed here and be very affected by the disease. 
um, and everything in between. So it, it's variable. Um, so in some respects, I think there's an underappreciation for the symptom burden that can come along with PZ and the other MPNs. Um, and the, one of the challenges is that many of these symptoms, for instance, let's, let's say fatigue. Fatigue obviously can be due to uh, many different causes. And the challenge is to distinguish, is this really related primarily to the patient's underlying polycythemia vera, or is it, in fact, due to something else? And so that, that is something that can be difficult to really pin down in some patients. But again, as, uh, as uh, physicians, we have to remind ourselves that it is plausible that any or all of these symptoms could be related to the underlying uh, MPN. So um, let's go through some of these. So blood clots or thrombosis. This is a major issue for patients with all MPNs. And, and, and as you'll see with um, uh, the subsequent slides, really the focus of our treatment is largely on reducing the risk of blood clots. Um, again, some patients do not have any blood clots, and that's great. Um, some patients, they come to medical attention because they had a blood clot. Um, other symptoms, headaches, visual disturbances, itching. This is a classic symptom with PV. Um, most classically, this, the itching is uh, incited by taking a warm or hot shower to the point where many patients just simply are, have to take cold showers, or they may have to take Benadryl before they take a shower. Um, Fortunately, as we'll discuss in a little bit, we, um, some of the newer uh, treatments for MPNs are pretty effective at dealing with the itching issue. Um, enlarged spleen. So some patients with PV, their spleen is not enlarged at all. Some, it is significantly large, and this can cause problems in terms of abdominal discomfort. It can lead to early satiety, which essentially means that patients um, fill up easily or quickly, so they start eating a meal, and within you know a couple of bites or whatnot, they find themselves to be feeling full and they cannot eat anything uh, more. Um, bleeding or bruising, this can be an issue. Um, and we'll talk about that in more detail. Uh, skin changes, um, night sweats, muscle aches, bone pain, fatigue. So again, you know, these symptoms can occur from a number of different causes, but it certainly is conceivable that they could be related to the patient's uh, PV. Okay, so making a diagnosis of PV. So first you start with an elevated hemoglobin or hematocrit. And uh, as, a, as a clinician, when we see this, the first question we ask is, of course, what is the cause of that? But specifically, could it be what we call a secondary cause? And that would essentially be something that's causing hypoxia, something where the, where the body's not getting enough oxygen and it responds by producing more blood, red blood cells to compensate since red blood cells carry oxygen. So common things being common, smoking, some type of lung disease, COPD, sleep apnea, these are all common causes of an elevated hemoglobin. And so when I see a patient in consultation who has not had any specific workup as of yet, but we know they have an elevated hemoglobin, I know statistically it's far more common that they do not have PV, but in fact their elevated hemoglobin is due to one of these other causes. Um, testosterone is another common cause, so, uh, uh, you know, there are good reasons for patients to be receiving supplemental testosterone, um, but in some patients that can drive up the hemoglobin. So that is one of the first patients I'll ask. I'm sorry, one of the first questions I will ask a patient uh, when I, you know, again, if they have not been worked up yet is, you know, are you using testosterone? Um, as I mentioned before, the other blood counts can be elevated. Um, this would, if anything, you know, if you see a patient with elevated hemoglobin, and they have an elevated white blood cell count and elevated platelet count, it would make me more suspicious that they, in fact, do have PV, because you wouldn't necessarily expect that with a secondary cause of an elevated hemoglobin. And then the JAK2 mutation, as I mentioned, present in more than 95% of patients with PV. So because of that, this is a very good diagnostic test for PV. If the patient has the JAK2 mutation, they probably do have PV. Conversely, if they are negative for JAK2, they most likely do not have PV. Uh, Averthopoietin or EPO level is typically low in patients with PV because the bone marrow is producing these red blood cells. Normally, uh, in a normal situation, EPO would drive production of red blood cells. However, here you don't need the EPO. The bone marrow has just kind of decided to, to do it by itself without stimulation from, T from EPO, and so that level should be low. It doesn't always hold, but classically the EPO level would be low. Bone marrow biopsy 
is recommended to diagnose PV, um, and what you would expect to find, as, you, as shown in the picture here, is that there are a lot of cells. So hypercellularity meaning there are more cells than normal, um, reflecting this increased cell proliferation. Um, I, on the subject of do you need a bone marrow biopsy to make a diagnosis of PV, um, the, the strict answer is yes, it should be done. Um, but in practice, I personally will not mandate a bone marrow biopsy if it's quite clear that the diagnosis is PV. So for instance, if the hemoglobin is markedly elevated, the patient has a JAG mutation, let's say the EPO level is low, that's almost certainly the correct diagnosis is PV, and the utility of a bone marrow biopsy becomes somewhat debatable. Um, there are reasons you know, in favor of doing the bone marrow biopsy, even in that situation, such as to ensure that there's not something else going on in the bone marrow, or that there's a more advanced stage of an MPN, such as myelofibrosis, um, which cannot be completely excluded unless you do a bone marrow biopsy. So it's never wrong to do a bone marrow biopsy, um, but I do, I do take into account the whole picture and patient preference in determining whether to do a bone marrow biopsy to make a diagnosis of PV. Okay, so prognosis of PV. Overall, it's quite favorable. Um, and that what I mean by that is that patients typically are going to live years with this disease um, to the point where, you know, if a patient who, you know, typically is diagnosed at older age, let's say a patient's in their 70s, it's very conceivable that um, in the end, and, you know, in the long term, PV will not be the issue or the complicating factor in terms of um, the patient's overall lifespan. Um, there are studies that have looked at large, relatively large numbers of patients with PV, uh, indicating that there is some impact on um, on overall survival. However, it's relatively modest, particularly in comparison to, for instance, myelofibrosis, which we'll talk about in more detail later. So, what the treatments for PV are really focused on reducing the risk of blood clots or thrombotic complications, and we'll talk about that in more detail. Um, that, uh, at the very least, we have um, good options for reducing that risk. Um, the other complication um, is that in patients with PV, over a time, a subset will evolve into more advanced stages, such as myelofibrosis or acute leukemia. There, we do not really have very effective treatments to prevent or delay that, um, so it's something that simply must be monitored for. Um, and then, you know, the appropriate workup and management if that should happen. Okay, so again, I said that treatment for PV is largely based on trying to reduce the risk for blood clots. And we look, when we look at any individual patient, we think, what is their risk for thrombosis? And, and it's different depending on a couple of factors. So number one, if they've already had a history of a blood clot. So history repeats itself, so that automatically makes a patient higher risk for a future blood clot. Uh, and the other um, main factor we, we consider is age. So at older age, um, and with most guidelines, the cutoff is age 60 or, or older, then their patient, a patient would be considered higher risk for blood clots, and the treatment uh, uh, recommendations might be somewhat different. Uh, we also could consider other risk factors for blood clots, such as um, you know, cardiovascular risk factors, high cholesterol, diabetes, smoking, things like that. Um, and they're not um, as well they're not as valid, well validated in terms of being a risk factor, but uh, again, it factors into our thinking in terms of what to recommend for treatment. Okay, so what are the various types of treatments for PV? So first, low-dose aspirin, meaning A1 milligrams, maybe. Um, 162 or even 325, but not higher um, doses than that because uh, there has been some association with increased bleeding in patients who take higher doses of aspirin. Uh, so this would essentially be recommended in all PV patients unless they have some bleeding issue that makes the use of aspirin, um, uh, you know, not safe. Um, so essentially every patient with PV would be treated with low-dose aspirin. Phlebotomy, a very simple method to reduce the hematocrit, get rid of the extra blood cells. Um, the goal here is to keep, get the hematocrit below 45, um, and that can be achieved with phlebotomy. Uh, the issues, uh, the potential issues with phlebotomy are uh, include that it can induce iron deficiency. That's really expected, and, and in some respects, the goal of phlebotomy to reduce the number of blood cells, which leads to iron deficiency. Um, and, you know, that, that then essentially slows down 
the production of red blood cells to some extent. Um, this can, if this occurs, it will often be accompanied by what we call a reactive thrombocytosis or an elevation, elevation of the platelet count because that's, that can happen in the setting of iron deficiency. It is not a necessarily a problem uh, when that happens. It just becomes a little bit confusing or complicated since we know that the disease itself can lead to elevated platelets. So, again, uh, there, when if the, elevated, if the platelet count becomes elevated, uh, it, there's a question of how much of it is related to the iron deficiency induced by phlebotomy and how much of it might be due to the disease itself uh, manifesting with an elevated platelet count. An alternative to phlebotomy would be hydroxyurea, which would be a medical uh, form of therapy. And, uh, it's an oral medication that's taken once or twice a day. Um, so in that sense, it, it could be considered uh, more convenient than phlebotomy since you don't need to go in and get the phlebotomy done. You just take a pill once or twice a day. Um, the goal is the same in terms of uh, lowering the pancreas to below 45 and keeping it there. Uh, and hydroxyurea has additional potential to uh, normalize white blood cell count and platelets, you know, especially if it's a patient who has elevated white counterplatelets to begin with. Um, this would be recommended specifically for patients who are considered higher risk for blood clots, such as those who had a prior history of blood clot or um, uh, are age 60 or older. Okay. Um, so phlebotomy, hydroxyurea, aspirin, those are all commonly used treatments. Ruxolitinib or Jacify. Um, we'll talk about that in more detail in my, when we talk about myelin fibrosis, but this is a specific inhibitor of JAK2, um, which was approved a few years ago uh, for patients with polycythemia vera. It is specifically uh, approved for those who are refractory or intolerant to hydroxyurea. Um, and um, it, beyond lowering the counts and controlling the hematocrit, it also can be effective for symptoms. So I mentioned how itching can be a big problem for some patients. Rexlinum is quite effective for itching, um, and so for those that have a, um, a significant symptom burden, uh, Rexlinum can be a good choice. Um, those patients who are truly refractory or intolerant to hydroxyurea are the minority. Most patients tolerate hydroxyurea just fine, and as far as um, achieving a good response, it's typically a matter of titrating the hydroxyurea dose to achieve um, the appropriate response. There is a, a subset of patients, probably no more than 25% of patients with PV, who really truly are hydroxyurea refractory or intolerant. All right, last on the list, interferon alpha. Um, this is a, a treatment that has been plagued by tolerability issues over the years. Um, it can cause flu-like side effects. It can exacerbate if there's an underlying psychiatric disorder. Um, this can be exacerbated by interferon, uh, but the um, somewhat newer formulations of interferon, which are slower, uh, longer acting and can be given once a week, uh, are a little bit better tolerated. Uh, but, and the, really the attraction or potential utility of this drug is that, number one, it, unlike hydroxyurea or rexolinum, it actually can lead to a molecular response, which essentially means uh, a decrease in the JAK2 mutation. So, for instance, let's say that before starting interferon, the 80% of the cells carry the JAK2 mutation. With interferon, you might see down the road that's gone down to 40 or 30 or 10%, uh, and in rare cases to zero or undetectable, uh, from specifically from the use of interferon. So that has some appeal, um, although we don't really know. If you look again even more long term, so say over 20 years or more, whether that has any uh, direct translation to the long term outcome. Um, so it's, it's at this point somewhat uncertain. But interferon also can be a good choice specifically for those who are young, uh, young women in particular who may um, want to become pregnant or are pregnant, where interferon is safe to be used during pregnancy. Hydroxyurea technically is contraindicated, um, uh, so it's not supposed to be used. So here, interferon can be a good choice. As I mentioned, tolerability is an issue. Uh, insurance coverage also can be difficult. Um, to gain access to interferon. Coming down the pike, um, there is an even newer form of interferon, Ropeng interferon, which is in clinical trials. That drug can be given even less frequently. I think it's every three or four weeks, and so that could turn out to be a good option as well um, once it potentially um, is approved by the FDA. Okay, so... 
Moving on to essential thrombocythemia or ET. This is very um, somewhat analogous to polycythemia vera in that it is characterized primarily by an elevation of one type of blood cell, in this case, platelets. You can see in this um, picture these little purple things, these are platelets. So this is too many platelets, there's more than you expect, uh, which is what you see in the case of ET. All right, um, and where are the signs and symptoms in ET? They are, uh, in some respects, very similar to PV. Um, headaches, dizziness, weakness, those kinds of things, which, again, could be due to a number of things, but um, also could be attributable to ET. Um, this burning or throbbing pain in the feet or the hands, uh, erythromalalgia, the, 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 the extremities can turn red and become very painful. Um, there's the risk, increased risk of blood clots. Bleeding can be a concern. It's kind of the uh, opposite of what you might expect. Um, you expect too many, you know, risk for blood clots, but also the opposite, you can have uh, an increase in bleeding. So this is thought to be because the platelets are not only increased, but they're also abnormal. So they don't function properly, and in particular when the platelet count gets very, very high, um, which we, what we call extreme thrombocytosis, um, typically defined as platelets greater than 1.5 million, there is where their risk for bleeding is thought to be particularly an issue. So um, if a patient is deemed to have a procedure, let's say they need a colonoscopy or a surgery, um, and the platelet count is above a million, we might um, do something about that specifically because of the procedure or surgery, whereas in, uh, otherwise we might say that the risk is uh, not that high and, and, and not uh, actually treat it specifically. Um, similar to PV, patients can have an enlarged spleen, um, not necessarily, but it can occur, uh, and a number of other symptoms, fatigue, weakness, low-grade fevers. Again, some patients feel perfectly fine with ET. They can work full-time. They do not have significant symptoms, but others have um, somewhat severe um, symptoms. Okay, so to make a diagnosis of ET. So, uh, again, analogous to PV, a uh, patient would have a high platelet count. It would, it would persist over time. Uh, generally, we want to see that there's at least two or more CBCs separated by, you know, some interval that consistently show an elevated plate account. Here, a bone marrow biopsy like PV is recommended, um, and what you would expect to see is increased megakaryocytes. These are the cells that ultimately give rise to platelets. Um, but it, it, it's all, this is also these where you need to exclude other things. So, could this be PV? You know, let's say the plate account is elevated, but the hemoglobin is also borderline elevated. Is that PV or is it ET? Uh, myelofibrosis, which we'll talk about in more detail, this can mimic ET, um, particularly if the, plate, if the hemoglobin is kind of borderline. Let's say it's 12 or 11, then um, there becomes more of a question as to whether this could, in fact, be early myelofibrosis instead of ET. Uh, and then the other one, which as a clinician, we really want to make sure we do not uh, mix up with ET is chronic myeloleukemia or CML. That disease typically presents with an elevated white blood cell count, but in rare cases, the, uh, an elevated platelet count can be the primary feature. So that's pretty simple to do in terms of ruling out uh, a diagnosis of CML, and that's by specific testing for that disease. So that should be done uh, in conjunction with the workup for ET. So the genetic mutations that occur in ET are, are slightly more complicated than PV. So yes, the JAGT mutation can occur, as it does in PV, but here it's only about 50% of patients that have the JAGT mutation. So you can see in the middle um, pie chart here, um, this blue is the JAGT mutation about 50 to 60%, and only recently in the past, say, five years, have we been able to um, learn that a good a good uh, chunk of those that lack the JAGT mutation, all of these guys, um, the majority of those, shown gray here, harbor a mutation in the Cal R gene or Cal reticulin, um, and then there's a remaining sliver uh, in yellow, who of patients who have mutations in MIFL, which is the um, receptor for thrombopoietin or TIPO. So that all makes sense to the extent that. Um, CalR, um, while initially it was not understood um, what it did when these mutations are found, it's now been demonstrated that CalR mutations 
do lead to activation of JAXTAT signaling. So, in a sense, they function similarly to JAXTAT V617F, leading to activated signaling downstream of JAX2. Um, we also make, want to make sure that there are no other secondary causes, just like with the LA and hemoglobin, there can be other causes, and, and in fact, those are more common than ET. So, uh, a classic would be iron deficiency. So, a patient who's, who has anemia and a highly elevated platelet count, but um, it turns out the patient had severe um, menstrual bleeding, let's say, and that led to iron deficiency and that drove up the platelet count. So, you fix that issue, and the platelet count should go down to normal. Um, another cause of only a platelet count would be severe infection or inflammation. Typically, this would be a patient in the hospital, but let's say a patient has a severe chronic inflammatory disease, an autoimmune disease, uh, say lupus or, or rheumatoid arthritis, that could be associated with an elevated platelet count. Okay, so prognosis and ET. So prognosis overall is quite favorable, similar to PV, and if anything, it might be even better than PV. Again, the study that I referenced for PV, we're looking at relatively large numbers of patients. If the lifespan of patients with PV uh, compared to normal individuals of the same age is actually almost identical, so it uh, indicates that there's very little impact overall in terms of survival. Obviously, in any individual patient, anything can happen, but we're looking at as a group, uh, it looks like um, survival is pretty close to normal. Uh, so, as again, we mentioned in PD, the treatments we use for ET are focused largely on trying to reduce the risk of blood clots, and also analogous to PD, patients with ET can evolve into mild fibrosis or acute leukemia, and that would be great if we could eliminate that risk. However, we do not currently have uh, therapies that can reliably do that. Okay, so thinking about treatment planning, again, similar to PV, um, treatment decisions are largely based on the patient's risk for blood clots, and that's related to prior history of blood clot, advanced age, defined as over 60, um, cardiovascular risk factors, and then JAK2 mutation positive. So here, where only about half of the patients carry the JAK2 mutation, uh, we can ask, well, is there any association between risk for thrombosis and presence or absence of JAK2? And it has been shown that patients who harbor uh, mutations in CalR uh, have a lower risk than uh, patients with uh, DT and the JAK-T mutation in terms of um, risk for blood clots. So there's some distinction there between whether a patient's JAK-2 mutation positive or CalR mutation positive. CalR, again, would be lower risk for blood clots. Okay, so treatment options for ET. So some of, some of the same options we have for PV. So low-dose aspirin is recommended for all uh, patients unless there are bleeding complications. I put in the parentheses most because there are um, some exceptions to that. Um, specifically, if you have a very young patient who has had no complications, no blood clots, they are CalR mutant, so their risk for blood clots is also lower. Um, in, in selected instances like that, it may not be necessary to be treated with aspirin at all. Although, and from my practice, I generally will put all patients with aspirin um, just to be safe. Um, hydroxyurea, um, similar to PV, also we use it in patients considered higher risk for thrombosis, and that is based on age greater than 60 or prior history of uh, blood clot. So either of those two things, the patient's higher risk, we will typically use something like hydroxyurea to reduce that platelet count down to normal. And Negrolite is another option um, for reducing the platelet count. It's um, typically used as a second-line agent if the patient has an issue with hydroxyurea, um, but it is a perfectly acceptable drug, um, so it's, it's not uncommon to use that drug, if, again, if there's some issues with hydroxyurea. Uh, interferon also can be used in ET, and it does um, it can lead to a, a decrease in the JAG2 mutant allele burden, as I described for PV. So that is, um, you know, perhaps a positive sign, um, but most commonly it's used for your young, uh, pregnant, or, or thinking about becoming pregnant uh, women. Uh, but um, again, it, it can be limited in terms of tolerability and uh, access in terms of insurance coverage. 
Ruxolitinib is not approved for treatment of ET. Uh, it can be used off-label uh, for ET patients who are essentially refractory or tolerant to multiple treatments. I, I, that's where I, I consider it um, typically is those who have had trouble with multiple drugs, such as hydroxyurea and anagrelide or and interferon alpha, and that's where I might consider Ruxolitinib. So it's, in the case of ET, it's, it's really not uh, that potent at reducing the platelet count. So um, you tend to see sort of limited um, benefit, but it is an option, again, for those who have problems with multiple other treatment options. All right, so moving on to myelofibrosis. So this is where it gets a little bit more complicated uh, in terms of explaining or understanding the disease um, because there are a lot of things going on. So number one, there um, is fibrosis or scarring in the bone marrow. That's why it's called myelofibrosis. And in this picture here, um, this is specifically staining for that fibrosis, staining for reticulin. And you can see these kind of elongated fibers. These are the reticulin fibers indicative of scarring in the bone marrow. And because of this, while, as I mentioned in the beginning of this talk, we think of NPNs as generally having high blood cell counts, here the blood counts can actually be low not always the case, but they can be low, and that's thought to be due to what's going on in the bone marrow with the scarring that essentially is unable to make enough normal cells. Um, now, uh, you know, again, anemia is very common in myelofibrosis. Um, white cell count can be low, it can also be high, and the same is true for the platelet count. Uh, also, myelofibrosis can be diagnosed um, as a, just a, a completely new disease, in which case it would be called primary myelofibrosis, but it can also occur after history of PV or ET, so post-PV myelofibrosis or post-ET myelofibrosis. All right, so in myelofibrosis, the mutations that are present in this disease are very similar to ET. So you can see here in this pie chart, very similar distribution as ET. It's about 50, maybe 60% of patients who are jacked immune about a third who harbor mutations in the CalR, uh, maybe five, 10 percent with mutations in nipple, um, and then you've got this sliver of about 50, here about, uh, I guess, about 10 percent of patients who lack any known mutation in these genes. So that's shown, uh, shown here again. Also, um, the disease is relatively uncommon, similar to PV. It is typically diagnosed um, at at least age 50 or older, um, but it can occur at any age, but because most of these patients are older, even despite the fact that they have more serious issues or more more, problem, uh, more severe forms of, of problems uh, clinically than patients with PVDT in general, um, uh, the treatments option, the treatment options for MS um, are also different. Okay, so the different symptoms with MS. So, here, um, in general, patients with myelofibrosis tend to have a uh, more substantial symptom burden than a typical patient with PV or ET. So severe fatigue, weakness, short of breath, shortness of breath, uh, partly related to anemia, partly related to just the disease itself. The spleens can become not just enlarged, but in some cases massively enlarged. This can cause um, a lot of pain, early satiety, as I mentioned, this can contribute to um, weight loss, sometimes 30, 40 pounds from the disease. Not just their spleen, but their liver can become enlarged. They may be at risk for bleeding. Um, platelets can become very low in some patients, which you know obviously contributes to the risk of bleeding. And they can have um, sometimes severe fevers and night sweats, drenching night sweats occurring on a, nightly, on a daily basis. Not in every patient, but in some patients. Um, bone, bone pain, weight loss, as I mentioned. So. Um, again, in general, the symptoms can be uh, more problematic in patients with myelofibrosis. So making a diagnosis of myelofibrosis here, um, a bone marrow biopsy is really mandatory, which is a distinction from PV and ET where I said that, that although they're recommended, they're not truly mandatory, uh, at least in my practice. But you expect to see in the bone marrow um, abnormal appearing and increased number of megakaryocytes, which are thought to be important in the pathogenesis of the, uh, pathogenesis of the disease. 
and the fibrosis or scarring, which I mentioned uh, a few slides ago. Uh, you would also expect to see an enlarged spleen. Yeah, we can't. We do have some patients who do not have a large spleen. The majority of at least mild, in some cases, massively enlarged spleen, and the blood counts. So typically, the um, uh, the types of blood cells you see are different than normal. So you see a lot of these nucleated red blood cells, and uh, um, you see um, immature myeloid cells, such as these, not, not just neutrophils. Um, and the shape of the red cells also is abnormal, so you've got these what we call teardrop RBCs, um, where it looks like there's a tear hanging off the cell. Um, and assessing the size of the spleen, it's common to use an imaging test, such as ultrasound or CT, or uh, as in, in most of the clinical trials, MRIs are actually used for an accurate um, uh, quantitation of spleen size. Um, physical exam, of course, um, we can comment on the length of the spleen below the costal margin or below the rib cage, um, but it's not generally as accurate as one of these imaging modalities. So I won't necessarily do an ultrasound or a CT in every patient with mild fibrosis, but in those who I'm having some difficulty uh, really clearly assessing the size of the spleen, I will, I will not hesitate to do that. Uh, we talked about the bone marrow and then JAK2 testing. We talked about the three different mutations, JAK2, CalR, and nipple, which are most common. Okay. So prognosis in MS is significantly more serious or severe than in patients with PD or ET. Um, there's a clearly a drop in lifespan and overall survival compared with um, a normal individuals of the same age. And um, there are different uh, prognostic scoring systems that have been devised to further um, define patients and their risk over time. So you've got on the left the DIPS plus. The plus indicates that this uh, model can be used at any point in the disease uh, process. So it's helpful in that way. It does not have to be, you know, does not, if it's a patient that's already seen somebody else and uh, coming for a second opinion, you can still apply the DIPS plus when they, when they come see you. Uh, this model takes into account a number of risk factors. You can see on the right here, uh, many of us listed, and different point values are given to these, and then they're added up, and then a uh, an aggregate score is um, factored in as to what risk category the patient falls into. So what are the different treatment options for myelofibrosis? This depends in part on the risk category, but also not entirely. Um, so in some patients who are low risk and have minimal symptoms, the counts are only mildly abnormal, we might just uh, do observation. So no intervention and let's just keep watching to see what happens. Um, whereas in the sort of opposite scenario, if the, if the blood counts and symptoms are very severely abnormal, um, we might consider stem cell transplantation. This is really the only currently available treatment option that has um, the potential for cure. Um, but because most patients are diagnosed at older age, that um, eliminates the possibility of transplant for many patients with good reason. If you take a patient in their, say, late 70s or even 80s and uh, attempt to transplant them, there's a high risk of significant complication, uh, risk for infection, bleeding, et cetera, and that can end up being worse than the actual disease or, in fact, in the worst case, of course, lead to um, death. So we typically think of transplant as being an option for younger patients. So, for instance, if I have a 45-year-old patient with high-risk myelofibrosis, that is when I would um, push strongly for consideration of transplantation. Um, anemia is a problem in patients with myelofibrosis, difficult to treat. Um, some of the things that can be used would include supplemental erythropoietin uh, in the form of, say, Procrit or Aranesp. Um, this has limited efficacy, um, but uh, I will give it a try in patients with severe anemia. If it's not working after a few months, it would be reasonable to stop it and avoid having, you know, just get rid of the uh, inconvenience of coming in for the injections. Um, and then, of course, supportive care of transfusions is an option, and we use that liberally in patients with severe anemia. Um, if they need a transfusion, we'll give it to them. Um, there is a risk over time with many transfusions of iron overload, um, but uh, the reality is that those 
those issues are would be way down the road, and um, and uh, I do not feel strongly that iron chelation is needed, especially early in the early going of needing blood transfusions. So the spleen can become very large, as I mentioned, um, not just mildly but massively large in some patients. And so there's medical treatments such as rexolinib, which we'll talk about in more detail. But it, let's say there's a problem with that or it's not working, then some of the options can include radiation therapy, uh, an embolization procedure. Those things are both um, um, uh, sort of self-limited or transient in terms of their benefits. Um, and to come along with uh, pain, the embolization procedure can result in a, uh, acute um, high levels of pain for the procedure. Uh, splenectomy would be a surgical option to remove the spleen entirely. That seems like an attractive option. You kind of get rid of the problem, and it can be or can result in a good outcome for for um, for some patients. Uh, but in others, it can lead to complications, bleeding, um, infection, etc. Uh, blood clots that can happen around the time of the surgery. So um, we tend to reserve splenectomy for those only with massive splenomegaly and for whom uh, rexolinib or jacophy is not an option um, because there isn't a whole lot else at that point that can be offered for specifically for the enlarged spleen. All right, now, JAK2 inhibitors. So rexolinib, and then I'm going to talk briefly about some of the other drugs in this class, procretinib, momolotinib, and fedranib which are, are currently still under um, clinical development and have not been approved by the FDA. Okay. So Rexolitinib, or Jacify. Uh, this is a JAK2 inhibitor. It's FDA approved for the treatment of myelofibrosis. It was approved in 2011, so um, we have a fair amount of experience now with this drug. Of course, not 30 or 40 years, but seven years since its approval and, and longer than that since it first went into clinical trials. Um, what it's particularly useful for is symptoms. So enlarged spleen, night sweats, fatigue, itching, bone, muscle pain. These things tend to, uh, to respond to rexolinib. Uh, in some patients who have severe symptoms, it's literally a miracle drug for them uh, in terms of how they feel, and that is fantastic. Um, it uh, is specifically indicated for those who are intermediate or high risk for MS, so low risk patients who don't have a lot of symptoms, there is not necessarily, there's no indication for rexolinib, and there's not necessarily any reason to, um, to, to believe that it would be beneficial if they were to go on rexolinib when they really have minimal or no symptoms. Uh, side effects from rexolinib, it lowers the blood counts, and that can be an issue if the patient's already anemic. To make that worse, it can lead to the patient needing blood transfusions. Um, so anemia doesn't get better, it gets worse, and the platelet count can, can, will, will go down. So in some cases, the patient will become thrombocytopenic, meaning they have an abnormally low platelet count, or if it was already low to begin with, it can drop to levels where it's simply uh, unsafe in terms of risk for bleeding. Um, it's also been observed that patients treated with rexolinum seem to have an increased risk for some types of infections. Herpes zoster um, has been seen uh, in patients treated with rexolinum. Um, some Practices are now moving towards using uh, Shingrix, the new vaccine for, for Zoster. Um, and, um, and, uh, and, and using antiviral prophylaxis um, uh, as well. Um, there, there are also reports of some patients who have very severe infections, the kinds you would typically see only in patients who are severely immunocompromised. So this has been seen with rexolinib, although it's very, very uncommon. And so I, I, when, when I counsel a patient, I generally tell them I do not expect this to be a real issue, although I do mention it. Um, skin cancer, uh, increased risk of skin cancer has been seen in patients with treated with rexolinib. It is also a, an issue with hydroxyurea, so it's not really clear if one is better than the other as far as that risk in particular is concerned. All right, so investigational treatments. So there are three other, um, at least three other in inhibitors of JAK2 which have, are or have been in development. Uh, Pacritinib is a drug that, um, similar to rexolinum, does result in improvement in symptoms, shrinks spleens, um, but its distinction from rexolinum is that it seems to have very little to no effect on the platelet count. And that means that the drug can potentially be safely used in patients with very low platelet counts, even less than a platelet count of 50. Uh, whereas rexolitib is indicated only for patients with platelet count of 50 or higher. So that may be a particularly useful 
um, distinction for vacritinib. Um, the drug is currently in FDA, uh, it's currently in the clinical trials, um, and um, based on the most recent uh, announcements, it sounds like uh, it will still be at least a year or more until the possibility of the drug being approved by the FDA. There were some safety concerns that were raised previously, um, and those are being addressed with the ongoing clinical trials. Momolotinib is another JAK2 inhibitor, um, with the distinction here being that in, in, in the clinical trials of this drug, there's been an indication that momolotinib can improve anemia, at least in some patients treated with that drug. Um, the, um, the rights of this drug were, current, were previously under the auspices of Gilead and um, have recently been licensed out to a, a company called Sierra Oncology. So we will see what happens with further development of momolotinib. Pedratinib is um, also a, a, medic, a drug that's been through a couple of different um, phases. Um, it was, it, its rights are currently under um, Celgene and it, there's the possibility that it could be an effective choice as a second-line agent after Rexolitinib. Okay, so other complications that can occur with MF. So over time, the blood counts can get worse. So anemia can get, go from mild to severe. Patients can receive or become dependent on transfusions. The same can be true with thrombocytopenia or low platelet count. Spleens become, can become uh, progressively more enlarged. Um, and um, in a uh, subset of patients over time, the disease may transform to acute myeloid leukemia. Okay, so I want to spend the last couple minutes just talking briefly about clinical trials. So I'm sure many of you in the audience are familiar with the concept of a clinical trial, but I just want to you know, get it out there that what is a clinical trial? It's really it's some, a, a research study that's carefully designed, has to be approved by um, the a particular institution's um, review board as um, uh, being you know, ethically appropriate and, and safe uh, you know, as far as um, can be designed and with the goal of, um, of, the, of the people who are conducting the study to improve treatment options for patients, uh, ideally increase survival, improve quality of life, and um, this is obviously the, 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 the conduit to lead to newer, safer, and potentially more effective therapies for MPNs and other diseases. So to get a drug to become FDA approved, such as Russellinib, it has to go through these clinical trial phases. Who should participate in a clinical trial? Um, so not necessarily everybody, but it's not just for those with the most advanced disease. There are every clinical trial is different. Some are targeted to those who are sort of at the you know um, most end stage of, of their disease, um, but there are others that are really targeted towards earlier in the disease. So um, there, it run it spans the gamut, and you know it, patients should really not wait for any standard treatment to fail if we're asking about studies, but ask about it up front. Um, and to that extent, uh, for those of you that um, are uh, being seen in a, in a practice where the physicians do not, uh, do not have a specific focus on these diseases, um, I think it's uh, very reasonable to go seek consultation at an academic center where these clinical trials um, uh, are, are being conducted. So um, many, in many instances, for, for instance, in my practice, I'll see a patient for consultation. We'll decide, say, that there isn't a specific clinical trial that would be a good option at the time, um, and they may just come for the one visit for, you know, to receive recommendations, and then, you know, particularly if they live a quite a distance away, they won't necessarily come back. Um, so I would encourage uh, those of you who, for whom it's feasible, to at least go to an academic center where there is a specialist who is focused on myeloproliferative neoplasms and have at least an, uh, a one-time consultation. Okay, so I'm going to finish up here and just, just point to uh, some examples of clinical trials. This is not intended to be an exhaustive list by any means, but just to give you an idea of some of the types of clinical trials that are out there. So first subject or first grouping is the JAK inhibitors. So there are clinical trials ongoing with Procritinib. Uh, for Dratinib, there should be a, a new clinical trial coming soon. Momolotinib, several of the clinical trials recently finished. We'll see 
what ha if there's another new study coming soon, uh, now that the ownership of, of the rights to that drug have uh, been transferred. Um, and then the second category is combination studies of Rexlitum. So um, there are a number, this is only a, a small list of them, but studies where patients are already being treated with Rexlitum. Um, and the idea is that you've, you've gotten to a stable response from the Rexlitum, um, and now um, you add in an experimental agent to see if you can achieve additional benefits. So the first one is with a, what we what is called a PI3 kinase inhibitor. That study is ongoing at multiple sites across the country. Um, the second one is a study with a drug called LCL161. This is, uh, this is a drug that's uh, targeting the inflammation uh, present in patients with myelofibrosis. This study, I believe, is still open at MD Anderson. And the third study is with a drug called Pevanetostat, which is an inhibitor, of, uh, which inhibits NF-kappa B activity, also connected to inflammation and MPMs. Um, and that is a study which we are conducting here at Washington University. So, um, again, if you go to any of the major academic centers, um, there, there's, a, there's a decent likelihood they'll have one or more of these types of studies available um, uh, for which, you know, participation may be a good idea. Uh, I'm also going to highlight here a couple of other agents that have been um, in clinical trials and, and have received some attention and interest. So PRM-151 is an antifibrotic drug, and so the idea is to reduce the fibrosis in the bone marrow, um, and hopefully that would lead to uh, additional improvements in terms of the patient's symptoms and clinical features. Um, the, the study with that drug is ongoing. I don't believe that any further patients are being enrolled, but um, it, would be, it would be of interest to see the next update on the results of that study. And the Telstat is a telomerase inhibitor, which has shown showed encouraging activity in the initial um, early phase study conducted at Mayo Clinic, and, and there's an ongoing study at multiple sites across the country now. Um, I believe enrollment is completed, uh, and we're, again, looking to see uh, an update uh, on the results of that study, hopefully coming soon. And then finally, Luspatercept um, and, and its cousin, so Tatercept, are drugs that um, are targeted to red blood cell differentiation and maturation and have the potential to improve anemia. So this is where you're specifically going after the anemia in patients with myelofibrosis. And in the early phase study with Sotatercept, uh, encouraging results were seen in terms of anemia response, and now Luspatercept is being investigated in an ongoing clinical trial. So again, this is not a complete list. Um, if you're interested in clinical trials, you can check out some of the links that I have here on the below. Clinicaltrials.gov is the uh, you know, entry point for all clinical trials across the country. So you can search for myelofibrosis or myeloproliferative neoplasms or things like that and, and find um, studies that are, are ongoing and recruiting patients. And if you go to the MPN Research Foundation website, there's a specific um, page that lists a number of these clinical trials. So that's a, a somewhat efficient way to see what are some of the MPN studies that are ongoing um, that could be of interest. So. I think that's my last slide, so I'm going to stop there, and I'll be happy to address any questions at this point. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. O, for your presentation. Uh, we did get a few questions. Uh, our first question comes from Gary, and Gary would like to know, what are your thoughts on interferon for myelofibrosis patients? Yeah, so that that is a good question. So, I, I you know, I'm, I'm just going to sort of give a, more of an overview of interferon and, and answering questions. So uh, as I mentioned um, in the talk, for PV and ET, interferon can be a good option for particularly those young um, patients who, um, you know, if they're either pregnant or thinking about conceiving, we wouldn't necessarily want to use hydroxyurea. Um, and so I, 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 def I, I will often recommend interferon in that setting. It's to specifically... The use of interferon for myelofibrosis um, it's not something I use as commonly. Um, there, there is, you know, there is literature uh, um, regarding the um, efficacy of interferon, particularly for those who have lower stage disease, um, that uh, good responses can be seen. Um, but I would say that overall, for most patients with myelofibrosis, I will tend to use ruxolitinib if they have for instance, splenomegaly or constitutional symptoms, and that's by far something that I use more so than interferon for myelofibrosis. All right. Thank you. 
Uh, our next question comes from Kathleen, who is the representative of our promotional partner of the MPN Advocacy Education International Group. Um, and she says, thank you, Dr. O and uh, AMDSIS. Um, her question is, as an advocacy organization, they hear from patients weighing the option of a bone marrow transplant. Specifically, when should they explore um, this as an option? Um, she says they're feeling okay but don't want to wait until they're too sick. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, that, that's a really important question and a, and a very difficult question to answer. Um, it's, it's one of those things where you don't want to wait too long uh, but you don't want to do it too early. Um, as as you as as mentioned, you know, a patient is feeling okay. So in one sense, you know, why take that risk of potential complications from transplant when they're feeling good? But they also, you know, if you wait too long, that could uh, make it even more difficult. So there's no there's no perfect answer. But amongst the factors to be considered would be using these um, these uh, you know these prognostic scoring systems, um, which again, with the DIPS Plus can be used at any time of the disease course, you can reevaluate which risk category the patient's in. So for instance, if they were, the patient is high risk versus intermediate risk, that would change, you know, how strongly you would feel about moving to transplant. Uh, there's also more and more evolving data about um, the utility of, of testing for other mutations. I did not mention this in, in my talk, but uh, particularly with myelofibrosis, we are beginning to more routinely test for additional mutations, and um, some of these mutations, if present, are associated with more severe aggressive disease. So, for instance, if I have two patients with uh, intermediate risk disease, and one of those has one of these what we call bad mutations, and the other does not, I would push the one who does have the bad mutation more aggressively towards considering transplant earlier because of that concern that, you know, the patient may feel fine, the blood counts may not be that abnormal, but I know because of that underlying uh, bad mutation that there's a higher risk of, of something changing sooner rather than later. All right. Thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Rachel. Uh, Rachel says that you mentioned an, uh, investigational agents for JAK2 inhibitors. Are there any for CALR inhibitors? Yeah, so that's a good question. So I, I, I guess I should clarify one thing. So ruxolinib and the other um, inhibitors of JAK2, um, they do tend to work for patients regardless of whether they carry the JAK2 mutation or CalR mutation or MIFL mutation. Um, we've seen responses demonstrated in all those types of patients. So in that sense, uh, you know, these drugs are not really specific for the JAK2 mutation, but rather they're specific for JAK2. And whether it's JAK2, CalR, or MIFL, they all um, a result in activation of JAK2. So in that sense, they're all targetable by these inhibitors of JAK2. But to specifically ask, answer your question about CalR inhibitors, there aren't necessarily uh, specific inhibitors of CalR, and that that is uh, partly related to what we think about the the actual mechanism by which these mutant CalR proteins are driving the disease. But there is a, a possibility and interest in immunotherapy for patients in particular who harbor this CALR, these CALR mutations, because these mutations, by the nature of the mutations, they result in the protein structure changing. And because of that, that could result in uh, sort of a new target for immunotherapy that wouldn't be present in a normal person. And so it might make it something that would be specifically um, something targetable by an immunotherapy type of approach that um, would not, you know, be toxic to normal cells. So that there is some interest in that. Um, we'll see if it pans out, but it is specific to CalR mutations uh, in that sense. All right, thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Don, and Don would like to know: Is there an MPN that is most associated with MDS? That's a good question. Um, so. The, the, the MPN, well, so let me, let me say two things. Number one is myelofibrosis, when we look at the cells in the bone marrow, we do see some abnormal abnormalities in their what we call morphology, which is how the cells appear. And that's the sort of hallmark of MDS is when you look at the blood cells, they look morphologically abnormal. So in that sense, MF would be the most similar to MDS. And in some cases, 
we are we have to um, debate whether the correct diagnosis is in fact myelofibrosis or is an MDS because in in some cases in MDS we can see some fibrosis in the bone marrow. So you know the question is is this myelofibrosis or is it MDS with a little bit of fibrosis? So that's that answers your question in part. But I would also just um, mention that there are what we call these MDS slash MPN overlap syndromes where they're a patient has mixed features of the two diseases and, and there are specific types of those. Um, most commonly is a disease called CMML or chronic myelomonocytic leukemia where there are too many monocytes but there's also often um, these morphological abnormalities um, characteristic of MDS. So it's well known that there are um, specific subtypes of these, these diseases that can, heart, that can essentially be present, uh, be uh, manifest with features of both MD, MPNs and MDS. All right, thank you. And since we're on the topic of CMML, uh, this next question that comes from Marie um, is asking, what is the difference between CML and CMML? Uh, good question. This <laughs> this is something that gets mixed up all the time, uh, you know, even amongst the you know, medical professionals. So the the two diseases are in some respects similar, but they're actually quite different. So CMML, like I described, chronic myelomonocytic leukemia, is a disease where there are too many monocytes being produced. Um, it's a mixture of an MPN and MDS. CML, chronic myeloid leukemia, is a specific type of MPN that is invariably associated with what is called the Philadelphia chromosome, which is a very particular abnormal, chromosomal abnormality that defines CML. So it, it, and, it and its characteristics um, include an elevated white blood cell count, uh, as well as uh, increased numbers of specific types of white blood cells, most classically an increase in basophils, um, and it can be present. Uh, it can also present with all the apoplectic count, as I mentioned, is something you need to screen for when evaluating a patient for ET. But it does not harbor the JAK2 mutation. Does not patients do not have CalR mutations. It's very distinct. It has this um, Philadelphia chromosome, or also known as BCR able translocation. So that is a very unique subgroup of MPNs, and the treatments are very different, and the outcome is very different for CML versus CMML. All right, thank you. And I believe our very last question comes from Darcy, um, who would like to know, is there any evidence of a link between Agent Orange and the MDS-MPN overlap? Um, good question. So, you know, that, that I think that's something where we don't really have a definitive answer. Um, more generally speaking, it's, a, it's, it's well established that exposures to some chemicals and radiation exposure um, can increase the risk of leukemia. Most, you know, most classically, benzene um, has been associated with leukemia. There's not as much specific literature with regard to MPNs or MPNs or MDS MPNs, but I think, uh, in principle, the same types of exposures could increase the risk for those as well. Uh, I'm not aware of any really particular, particularly convincing literature with respect to Agent Orange, but you know, in, in theory, it, it's conceivable that it could be a factor. All right. Well, I believe those are all the questions that we have today. Uh, thank you, Dr. O, for your wonderful presentation and for your time. Uh, for those that are still with us, um, I would also just like to add that if you would like to rewatch this webinar at a later time, please be on the lookout for an email that will provide you with an archive link within four to seven business days. On behalf of the Aplastic Anemia and MDS International Foundation, I would like to thank each and every one of you for joining us today, making us your resource of choice for information on bone marrow failure diseases. If we were not able to answer your question today, please send it to us via email at help, that's H-E-L-P, at aamds.org so that our patient educator can respond, or visit our online academy at aamds.org forward slash learn for interviews with experts and other programs that may address your question. As a reminder, as soon as I'm done speaking, a post-event survey will appear requesting your feedback. We appreciate your, your time to complete this survey. And again, thank you for joining us. And remember, learning is hope. This concludes today's program.